Лек поздрав всем. Округ Лицо, вероятно, сте видели Свинаяву. Ради се, желимо представити некако локални ситуации, кои су тренутно у наши неки земјама, така да су с нама, сад не знам да ли представим све, Тони Круг, Стипе Чурковић, Мислав Житко, Лупа Чановић, Маја Брезник, Марко Крјан, Вук Вуковић и Сава Јотић. Така да, некако желим, пошто смо мало касни, па ќе ми почети, желим да преку ова округло стола да покажати што е заправо значи неолиберализам и европска интеграција на овој подручје. Така да би ми некако из сваки држава ве представили угол како се одвија заправо кроз кои механизми и на како и на каква ситуација удружба устваре неолиберализам у локално подручје. Така да би ја можда географски почела и почела некако со словеначка ситуација, па би онда Марка замолила дали би некако започнал, па ќе Маја се исто на двеесет на нега. Okay, thank you. I will I will speak in English because I see there are some colleagues here left. And yes, but I know that it's quite a job to translate, so I will. I will try to speak in English. Uh, my 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 presentation, my short presentation here, cannot be so ambitious as you have uh, uh, tried to point out because uh, I am not sh uh, I, I'm not sure I'm not able to to link uh, the general economic and social situation here with the. Uh, mechanisms uh, of European integration. So uh, what I'll talk about is the situation and uh, maybe uh, at the end I could give you some thesis or hypothesis about uh, about uh, what uh, what this means in the relations of core and peripheral uh, countries in Europe. Uh, so um, to describe the, the economic situation uh, as briefly as possible, I would say we have to focus on two, two things. Probably first is uh, employment and unemployment. And probably now I will talk about this a little bit more. I will just give you some orientation information or data. And the second, uh, the second part uh, is uh, the, the debt crisis, or uh, maybe uh, uh, we better put to say, uh, the structure of the debt, uh, of the public debt and uh, the private debt, um, the mechanisms or uh, how it became what it is and uh, what problems it poses for the future development. Uh, so to just uh, to uh, present some uh, the, the, the general uh, of the crisis. Um, so in Slovenia, uh, the, the growth of GDP between 2000 and 2005 was from 0.5 to 4 percent uh, a year, uh, a modest growth rate but a stable one. Uh, then we witnessed a, a, a fast acceleration of growth in 2006 and 7, where the growth was 5.8 percent and in 2007 even 6.9 percent. And then quite a rough decline in 2009, to 8, <laughs> minus 8% eight, uh, of growth in 2009, then a short recovery in 2011, and again a session in 2011, uh, minus 0.2%. Uh, what this means in terms of employment or unemployment, uh, the number of employed persons in, the, in organizations and businesses uh, well, has fallen for about 5.5%, uh, 5 .5%. but if we uh, look at the sector of, uh, of small businesses, really small businesses, this decrease has been uh, uh, much, uh, much larger, it was uh, about 20-21%. Uh, so these are the unemployment uh, or employment uh, figures. Now what uh, Interest interests me more 
is uh, the problem of the debt. Uh, now, uh, at the present moment, or uh, the, the debt in Slovenia, um, and I'm speaking about the, the debt of uh, the public and uh, private debt together, uh, has began began to accelerate very fast uh, around 2004 2005 uh, so uh, the net indebtedness of swing businesses and uh, enterprises has grown uh, from practically zero in 2005 uh, to about 12 billion of eight billions of euros in 2008 2010 that means even before the crisis there was an acceleration of uh, of borrowing money uh, and if you look at the structure of the uh, of where these uh, loans or these credits were placed were allocated uh, one interesting feature and very important feature of the Slovene situation is that uh, the large part of these loans was made to businesses, to, to enterprises, to, to uh, business corporations. Uh, in fact, the, the share of, of uh, uh, businesses in, in, uh, in the uh, enterprises firms in the debt uh, is the largest in Slovenia. If you compare it to the European Union, it amounts to uh, almost, or, uh, almost 54 percent and uh, for instance, in the Eurozone, the average is 26%. Uh, uh, and uh, if you look at the, the specific countries, we can see that uh, countries which, uh, similar, with similar um, structure of debt are, uh, uh, or loans are um, located at the periphery of Europe. For instance, there is Bulgaria with a similar structure, 53%. And there are Latvia and Lit uh, Latvia and Lithuania with uh, 44, 45, 46, and uh, the first uh, Western or poor country, if you want, is Spain with about 40 percent. So why is this uh, uh, important? There was a, a growth of, of, of borrowing of credit, uh, which was mainly classic type of lending. It was not uh, uh, the borrowing in uh, uh, this uh, in the new sophisticated financial instruments. Actually, financial instruments uh, had a, made an important but uh, not a central role. Uh, their role was actually to uh, distract or um, to uh, uh, the, 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 the savings of, of people. The savings that were previously made in classical um, uh, instruments like uh, deposits in banks were diverted uh, to, for instance, um, insurance companies, uh, uh, investment funds and so on. This meant that uh, the banks did not have the money to loan, uh, to, to, bar, to, 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 to lend, and uh, although the, the, the general requirement was such that everyone was borrowing. So what the banks did was that they borrowed money from uh, foreign banks mostly, uh, and uh, then placed these uh, loans to, to the local uh, to the local uh, businesses and uh, households, uh, and uh, so uh, what happened uh, was that at the beginning of the crisis, uh, there was first the problem of uh, realization. The businesses, uh, the, 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 inf the inflow, the income of the businesses uh, fell especially those uh, working in the export sector, but uh, soon the others followed. Uh, so they were, uh, this was the first reason why they were not unable to, to pay off their, their debts, or at least it was becoming increasingly hard to do that. And the second problem was, of course, that these loans were, had collateral, which was uh, in real estate or financial assets, and uh, because of what happened in the financial markets, the value of these assets uh, has, has fallen. So this was uh, the second problem which makes um, a refinancing of the debt or, or of the credit much, much more um, problematic and, uh, and much more <coughs> dra uh, drastic. 
so uh, <coughs> one has to ask oneself, I think, two questions. The first one is uh, why this expansion of borrowing, uh, and the second one is uh, where did this money go? Uh, the answer to the first question uh, is a sophisticated one, and we do not have uh, uh, a sufficient answer at the moment, uh, because um, even the, those economists, economists that uh, are, are say, progressive ones or not so orthodox, and the ones that see that want to get to the root of the problem, um, <coughs> explain this in psychological terms. Um, they say that um, there was a period of uh, hazardous behavior of casino-like capitalism of, uh, and uh, a climate that um, favored uh, borrowing, uh, but they do not have uh, sufficient uh, structural um, explanation of why, or why uh, this was happening in such a large extent. Uh, this, so um, maybe this is a question for, for the discussion, uh, although I do not have a straightforward answer to this. Uh, where did the money go? Uh, well, um, it seems that uh, the la the, 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 a lot of this money was uh, invested uh, in all sorts of uh, financial uh, and real estate assets, uh, which of course uh, meant that after the crisis, uh, the value of these assets has decreased uh, dramatically, and uh, whereas the, the loans uh, that were used to pay for to, to, to buy this, uh, the, the, these assets uh, still remain, um, and uh, that's why the, the the companies are not able to pay off the debts to, to the banks. Um, uh, to conclude this short presentation uh, with with a, sh uh, with a brief example of uh, this investment, I would say uh, the problematic or, or, or simply false investment. Uh, these investments were made either into um, assets, uh, real estate assets or financial assets, which, uh, as we know, have uh, lost uh, a considerable part of their value and are worthless, um, or it was used uh, to finance the, the, the so-called fixed capital of, of these firms, but it, which was also um, completely ir irrational uh, in, in their extent. For instance, in the, in the sector of transport. Um, there is a, uh, a research done on this, which reports that um, in 2006, at the beginning of 2006, uh, the, um, the supply of these services, or the capacities of, of the firms that, that supply the transport services, were pretty much matching the, the, the demand for, the, for those kinds of services. <laughs> so the demand was rising until the end of the 2008, and then it was uh, slowly declining or stagnating. So there was nothing, uh, nothing uh, dramatical happening uh, when it comes to the demand for those services. But what, but what the firms in this sector did was that they doubled, in, in two, a matter of two or three years, they doubled their capacities. So at the present moment, there is a discrepancy between capacities and uh, actual demand for those services, which is about 100% uh, actually. Uh, so this is just a rough illustration of a particularly uh, problematic case. And to conclude, uh, we have a problem of very indebted uh, firms who have invested their money uh, in a wrong way, which does not bring any yield to them. Uh, those uh, firms are not able to pay off their debt to the banks. Banks that are uh, still, uh, uh, to some extent, to about three quarters uh, in the um, state-owned, uh, are now facing problems uh, because of these uh, defaults and uh, who has to intervene, uh, the government has to intervene, which um, provides capital or either directly or by uh, putting deposits uh, into the banks, and of course, um, because the income from, from, uh, from the, because the fixed fiscal income from taxes is uh, stagnating or uh, even a bit declining a bit, uh, it, it can do so only by uh, borrowing money uh, on financial markets, which is uh, becoming more and more costly. So, this is the situation. Okay, thanks, Marco. Uh, Maya? Uh, yeah, thank you. 
Um, I prepared my contribution in Slovene, but if it's easier, I will uh, try to improvise in English. Do you think so? Mm -hmm. uh, it's easier. Uh, all right. I will speak uh, in describing uh, neoliberal politics in Slovenia after the uh, declaration of independence. I will put forward two important features, and one is the process of uh, re-ethnization or the spring of nations after the collapse of socialist communist <coughs> regimes in the Eastern Europe. Uh, uh, Slovenia added its uh, contribution to this uh, re-ethnization with the erased. This is two, about 2,000 persons, uh, 20,000, sorry, 20,000 uh, uh, citizens of uh, ex Yugoslavian republics living permanently in Slovenia who uh, through the night lost their uh, permanent residence uh, in Slovenia and they became some papier, uh, some papier, although they were living all their life in Slovenia. I, I, couldn't, uh, sh I cannot show you a graph with um, uh, the uh, unemployment in Slovenia in that per period, but you would see um, uh, a line going up like this in the 92, and the erasure was a moment before uh, this uh, line um, uh, got to the, t to the top, and also, uh, and you will uh, see that the Eurasian contributed that the line uh, turn around and fall a little bit, but the, it never reached uh, the level in the 80s when unemployment was non-existent, uh, almost non-existent. So, um, uh, uh, so you, uh, uh, we see that uh, uh, the state was changed in this period and they used nationalistic feeling or atmosphere for um, um, re -establish or establishing a new kind of state which treats a citizens, a citizenship body as a human ca capital and uh, statesship as, um, um, as a management of human capital. And this was not anymore a state of people, but comprador state or is it comprador <coughs> st state of international capital. This, I think, is important uh, feature change between the socialist period and after <coughs> independence. The second important feature is the establish establishment of World Trade Organization and the privatization of public services. And it is not only about the robbery of public health system, education, uh, university, uh, also army and uh, police, uh, police forces, uh, about which we forgot often. Uh, uh, it is uh, problematic also because when you commodify public services, you, um, um, sub, um, uh, you commodify also the person or uh, the person, those, who do this job because it's not possible to separate um, uh, to separate um, uh, commodity um, service uh, from the work itself, and this creates a space for medi uh, for mediators who between the employer and employees, like subcontracting agencies, agencies for temporary employment, and so on who can make, raise a high profit uh, on the account of unhuman uh, exploitation of workforce. Uh, so in the background we have a deep transformation of labor market system. If you compare this situation with Marx and uh, Leibovitz, for example, analyzes in Beyond Capital, uh, in Marx time, uh, the work itself, labor, labor force, uh, was a commodity in the sphere of production. <coughs> um, uh, while the exchange of labor force was not so essential because the employer and employee, capital, uh, uh, and employee negotiate about the uh, price of labor force um, without mediator. Uh, since 90s, the, this Face uh, uh, um, exchange of workforce became um, autonomous, if I can say, if I can say so. 
uh, the high profits for supply of labor force uh, um, started. And with the development of international transport, it was not difficult anymore to bring a, a big quantity of labor force from Asia to, to uh, Gulf states, for example, or from East Europe to West Europe. Uh, we can say uh, millions of people were transported in, uh, during in uh, very short periods, for example. And uh, uh, one uh, important feature is also that it's possible to buy uh, workforce also in stocks and, uh, and to create, as a consequ consequence, uh, financial markets of labor force out of it. Uh, the result is double commodification of labor force. First uh, commodification is known in the past is in the sphere of production and the second type of commodification is in the sphere of exchange of labor force and for this reason the pressure on labor force is much higher than, uh, uh, than, uh, than uh, ever before. Uh, all those periods in the 90s and the twi two in the, after 2000, industrial sociologists question about um, what will be the, um, um, uh, the well, development of the labor market in Europe states. They were asking themselves if they, uh, whether uh, there will be convergence or um, the differences between the liberal market economy of United States or, and United Kingdom and the um, welfare capitalism of, uh, of European states will um, uh, uh, survive or will, will be, the differences between these two systems will, be, uh, will remain. Um, um, uh, it's interesting that happened ni neither first nor the second scenario, but what we got are the private uh, labor private labor markets, and that uh, the uh, industrial relations, the subject of the research, uh, was pushed to the social ma margin. Uh, for example, in Slovenia, we have. Uh, 30% of labor uh, uh, workers enrolled in trade unions, while the workers in atypical employments, workers who participate in these private labor markets, represent one third of, uh, of uh, labor force, uh, uh, meaning that um, the private labor market is much stronger than those traditional standard employments. Uh, with this, I would like only to conclude uh, that there is a um, symmetry between citizenship politics and labor market, uh, uh, labor market politics and that uh, all political play players will have to include these two, uh, these two <coughs> spheres in new trade union and political uh, activism or work. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think we will go forward and the uh, discussion will be at the end. So please, Mislav, uh, can you uh, start with your presentation from the top? Well, I uh, obviously had a um, um, uh, topic of um, financial liberalization and the shortcomings of export-led growth strategy covered on Friday. So I'll try, I'll, I'll try to be brief because there are so many of us on the panel. Uh, I think it is now clear that uh, we are uh, dealing with two peripheries, uh, one that is situated within the Eurozone and the other one outside of the Eurozone. These two peripheries are not equally important in the eyes of major uh, European institutions and they also share some of the problems, but uh, there are, there are uh, other uh, set of problems that uh, they do not share. Uh, so. Uh, I think it is, when we talk about Croatia, um, I think it is uh, quite clear that uh, the process of financial liberalization went hand in hand with uh, this extraordinary rise of imports. Um, as, I, as I tried to point out in, in fr on Friday, 
um, this led to a peculiar economic structure in which the banking sector dominates the entire economy. Uh, the other, the other problem that uh, stems out of it uh, is the problem of euroization. Uh, so, basically, uh, every administration has ha has to face the same difficulty, uh, namely, to try to uh, handle two currencies in a single country. This this leads to uh, extraordinary problems on many different levels. Um, currency mismatches uh, for households, um, exposure to currency risk for enterprises, and of course the, the government needs to handle the, these uh, levels while at the same time uh, taking a lot of um, uh, pressure from the uh, central bank that uh, really insists on uh, monetaristic uh, uh, policy framework. Um, so this is, this is kind of the basic outline of the situation. Um, I think that uh, the other problem that uh, Croatia faces today is, of course, uh, the tax system. Um, it is uh, quite clear that it, it is very difficult to pursue any kind of um, uh, uh, radical social policy when most of your uh, tax revenues come from value-added tax. So this is another uh, great obstacle in, reformula in, the, in, in reformulating uh, economic policy on a state level. Uh, even if we had a more radical social, dem uh, social uh, uh, democratic party in power, the, these uh, problems would, would still remain and would still persist. Uh, and so uh, I think that uh, the left in these on the second periphery, so in these peripheral countries outside of the, uh, of the Eurozone, needs to think uh, about, of course, the general problem of the crisis in the Eurozone, but also about uh, its own, I would say, sui generis problems, uh, uh, as it were, um, because um, uh, we can deal with uh, many different assumptions on, on in this, this type of theoretical debate. Uh, and I think the most plausible assumption today is that uh, from which we can start uh, to debate and, and to talk about these issues that nothing will change in Europe. I think this is, this is the most plausible uh, assumption and under this assumption we need to ask uh, the question what, uh, what is our maneuvering space? Uh, I mean when, when I say we, I mean we here on the second periphery outside of the Eurozone. Uh, what can we do? What, what can we do? And uh, what kind of policy uh, a left-wing government should <coughs> pursue if, uh, if uh, something like that uh, actually occurs? That a, le a real left, uh, a real uh, left-wing, uh, left-wing government uh, uh, takes power. Um, these are of, of course uh, quite difficult problems. So um, I think it is important to emphasize that. Besides creating uh, what, what, what we usually call a mass movement from below, it is also important to re-establish and reconfigurate re the dominant institutions. Uh, and, um, well, I'm going to stop here and perhaps uh, in a debate we can um, uh, focus on, on um, uh, these questions that I've put forward and maybe some others that I, I haven't... Um, <laughs> so um, I'm going to try to talk about um, the, um, let's say, the ideological and, and political, more narrowly political aspect of, of uh, what has been happening in Croatia for the past 20 years and is, is still um, uh, more or less going on. So um, for those who don't, those who know, uh, for, for those from Croatia, they uh, know all of this. But for those who don't know. If if um, if someone asked me now to describe the situation in Croatia and in relation to to um, the uh, um, so to, to, to try to to say oh, oh, where where did Croatia start 20 years ago what were the expectations and where has it ended up then we um, end up basically in a very um, uh, well as John Weeks uh, uh, said um, the other day uh, be careful what you wish for because Croatia at one moment after after the uh, um, after leaving Yugoslavia, the idea was, of course, 
that uh, we have uh, now to integrate into uh, into uh, into Europe. We have to distance ourselves from the Balkans, and um, uh, this is more or less um, the dominant. Let's say this is it's not it's like um, the ideological foundation for more or less every every type of policy that has been pursued. Be it a nationalist, be it uh, 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 pro-European, more or less, if, if you scratch the surface, uh, the, the, the structure in narrative is that of we have to finally become European again. And then there is this, this is very, um, I think, um, there is um, this, this saying or a joke in Croatia, I heard recently, um, which um, uh, basically sums, sums the whole process up very well. Because there was the, the middle classes of, of, of in Croatia, especially in the urban areas around Zagreb and so on, they have the, they had well this 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 um, culturalist uh, sentimental longing for Austro-Hungarian times, well when uh, Croatia was part of, of, of Europe proper, not of the backward Balkans, and uh, someone said then, well you know. Um, all of those who wanted to be part of 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 of, uh, of Austro-Hungary again, well, they got what they what they were asking for. Just as in Austro-Hungary, um, uh, foreigners and the church were owning everything. Well, we're today back in that situation. You know, the Catholic Church is the uh, uh, largest owner of real estate in Croatia, and 95 uh, uh, percent, I think, of the banking sector is foreign owned. So, uh, and as Misal said, the banking sector dominates the economy. So we uh, we got what we were asking for. Yeah. So and then the problem is, of course, um, the problem is um, with with a, with a very small open economy. We, we, we face what more or less uh, every other small open economy in Eastern uh, Europe uh, uh, went through. It's deindustrialization, de and uh, basically um, uh, um, GDP growth has more or less been financed by by uh, accumulation of debt. So and the question is then, the question maybe uh, the political question is, well, what about the left in Croatia? Has there been a left, and, and, and how did it argue, how did it position itself, how, how did it read these developments? And the problem is, more or less, that the left um, has, uh, has uh, basically continued uh, the, um, one aspect of the nationalist project, because one thing you have to know about Croatian nationalism, uh, as, as, as pompous and as, as vulgarly folkloristic as it was uh, in, the, in the 90s in its narcissism, uh, uh, Tuchman always well uh, emphasized we have to be uh, 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 you know find our way back to Europe you know like we belong there culturally civilizationally and so forth and basically um, what that translated uh, uh, into uh, as far as, as concrete policies are concerned was basically well with Tuchman there, there were some fractions of one sort or another but he had uh, uh, you know standby arrangements with the uh, IMF. Um, and of course, he, uh, his great ambition uh, uh, was um, was to enter the European Union. And the Social Democrats, uh, more or less, I mean, um, there is this very, this really uh, almost total uh, consensus uh, on, on the question that, that Croatia has to enter the European Union, while the European Union has been completely, uh, more or less. Um, Idealized, it is assumed that, that we are talking still about the, the, uh, the European Union of, of, the, uh, of the times of the peak of the welfare state, which of course is, is, is uh, uh, as we all know, no, no longer the case. Um, so there was this, this uh, absolute naivety, so this, this, uh, this foundational myth that you, once we enter Europe all of the problems will be solved. And uh, the ironic thing is even the Eurozone crisis, um, even uh, uh, even the news from that it did not in any way um, uh, uh, in interfere with with, with, with the um, well with, with this basic basic uh, foundational uh, uh, myth. So um, and the, the dangerous thing of course is that once you assume that that there is this there is this mythological threshold once you cross it in part of, uh, are part of the European Union that has at least two effects for one. Every uh, um, or, um, what what has been called the Euro integration process is basically very similar uh, to to, to um, well to a, a neoliberal restructuring of, of the uh, economy and of social services and so forth and so, so forth. But these uh, problems never really became uh, uh, political issues because they were all, uh, always already uh, in a sense. Um, 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 explained uh, as, as, as simply technical uh, necessary steps uh, for, for this backward Balkan country to finally reach uh, a standard of European normality. 
it's, uh, the, the, the final argument is always this is how they do it in Europe and that, that more or less ends all discussions. <laughs> and uh, so there is this really, uh, I mean, if, if you want to really to, to, to push this maybe uh, uh, politically further, I mean, it's, it's a neo-colonial mindset, you know, this is the, the center, they know how things are done. Uh, and the only reasonable thing uh, is to is, is to say well well you know uh, yeah yeah to follow but you know eagerly you know to, to prove that, that we are very good pupils and true Europeans yeah. so so in that sense um, uh, all the, the uh, well uh, if you if you look at at at, at, um, at the new spectrum, I think that the situation in Serbia is in that uh, in that um, aspect even more extreme uh, but in, in Croatia if, if you look. Uh, um, well, five years ago, until or, or three or four years ago. Now, I mean, social co uh, issues have now entered uh, entered the picture to, uh, to, uh, to some extent. But if you look um, for the for the for the for the greatest part of, of, of the transition period, the debates were about you know the war, of course. But then uh, about the generals, and then Hague, and this and that, you know, and, and about uh, all of these questions. Why uh, they were, uh, you know. Uh, they were more or less on, um, uh, the focus of, of political debates, and they were the line of demarcation between the left and the right. It was this? It was more or less um, the question of you know um, one's commitment, uh, you know, one's vision of the war, and, and this anti-Serb or, or you know, of phobic agenda, which which uh, uh, Tuchman um, more or less represented, and uh, the social democrats uh, or well, the left. The official left, the parliamentary left, saw it more or less as their mission to distance themselves on that level rhetorically, but in, in, in terms of uh, social policy, uh, in terms of economic policy, they basically continued along the same lines. So these problems became completely uh, uh, politically invisible, uh, 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 largely due to the fact that they were uh, uh, treated as techni technicalities uh, in the integration process. And what has recently been happening uh, is, as well, that. Um, that, that it seems well. There is there is a re reconfiguration, let's say, of the whole political imaginary in Croatia. I mean, uh, one one shouldn't overemphasize it. Um, the referendum, well, you all probably know, that Croatia will be, uh, well, probably, or you know, <laughs> <laughs> the next member of the European Union. So uh, we, we know uh, all that. But uh, so um, and well, from our perspective, basically. It, it was important, and uh, this is maybe something that uh, in debates these, these uh, past days uh, became quite obvious. Uh, the very critical, uh, a very cr uh, critical, uh, well, an emphasis on um, a critical emphasis on on the deficiencies of the European Union, because our, our position was, were, to, to some extent, that we have to provide uh, a, a, a convincing and thorough left critique of the European Union uh, uh, from the left. That is. Uh, otherwise, you know, um, uh, if, uh, otherwise the, uh, the right wingers uh, will take uh, take that over, you know. And once we enter the European Union, uh, given the, the conditions uh, uh, it, it is in, it is often, well. I feel that it's only a question of time until we will see what, what we are seeing all around Europe. There is this uh, a great disappointment in the European integration project and the resurgence of of, of, of uh, uh, right wing populism, you know. And uh, at that backlash. I think uh, we have to prepare ourselves uh, now, theoretically, and also in the terms of, 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 the, of how we pray to the debates or how we try to influence the debates uh, from, from a left perspective. So I'll end here. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'll ask Wolf to explain about the situation in uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina, where I think it's much more complex uh, than uh, uh, in other countries. Yes, so, so thank you. So I think. Um, I will speak a little bit more than my colleagues concerning concerning the situation in Bosnia, which is perhaps uh, the most complicated state in Europe. Um, in, in fact, it is so complicated that it is uh, difficult um, to think where to begin with uh, all of complicated aspects of Bosnian society. But uh, let us say as a little introduction that uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina uh, practically functions as a union of two entities and one district and then uh, ten cantons within federation with, with entity called Federation of Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, first, uh, firstly, uh, after war, uh, we, we had this manifestation of liberalizations in the sense of uh, destroying large factories in industries and mass bureaucratization. That means that, uh, that the system 
uh, employed much of people in, in this complex monstrous administration of companies, entities, and the state of, of Bosnia and Herzegovina, creating uh, a, a powerful clientelism in, in, in the sense that if you are a member of the party and uh, you will get a job uh, either in some, in some facility or in some, uh, in some firm that is still a state firm or in the bureaucracy, you will have a good salary but you will keep silent because it is, it is your job. It, it, it doesn't matter which of the parties is on the power, but you will keep silent because you got job because of the, that party that brought you here on your working place. So uh, the, th that, is, that is some kind of structural, structural problem in all Bosnia. Other problem, and the main problem of course, is the nationalism of the different uh, nationalistic elites ruling in Bosnia. In Bosnia, we have a, a three to four, well, let us say, nationalistic party and two social democratic party. One of which is the Union of Independent Social Democrats in Republika Srpska, in power in Republika Srpska currently, uh, which went totally right wing, uh, uh, becoming uh, more or more or less uh, clerical chatnik party. And within the uh, Federation of Bosnia and Herzegovina, now the ruling party is Social Democratic Party, uh, uh, which considers itself to be multi-ethnic and multinational, which is just partly truth, uh, because uh, they are um, <coughs> their main ideology is Bosnian pa patriotism, uh, which is again close to the Bosniak nation nationalism. As you know, we have three 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 constitutive peoples in Bosnia: Bosnia, Croats. And Serbs. So, uh, in, in that case, either that that um, uh, neither such social, social democrats, which uh, in their in their programs they have uh, neoliberal policies in the first place, of course, uh, neither them uh, they cannot uh, join the country or or make uh, any kind of reconciliation in in, in, in Bosnia and Herzegovina. As you know. Uh, the, the, the traumas of war are, are still present in, in, uh, in, everyday po in everyday's policy. Uh, that is the main question, uh, how, uh, how we can understand a war as a society. And uh, that is still a main discussion and not the social issues and social problems. Uh, and that is in, 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 that, in, in that measure uh, that uh, when you speak about that, uh, uh, many people will look you as some kind of uh, alien speaking about some kind of, of, of uh, fantastic problems from some distant planet and not the, the main problems in Bosnia because for for majority of people the, the ideological uh, um, uh, indoctrination uh, 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 is uh, on that level that uh, many oh, uh, let us that, that, that the main thing is let us settle first national question and uh, and the question of the war and then we will easily talk about other things such uh, as uh, as a uh, as a uh, this uh, squid of of, of 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 banking sector of international banks uh, this dist uh, destruction of, of of the public firms and so on and so on. The first question is still uh, nationalism. Uh, but, uh, uh, okay, uh, two years ago we started uh, in a unitary organization for socialism and democracy that is the small uh, tendency in which uh, I'm a member of, 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 of it. Uh, we started um, uh, uh, we started to question this whole political discourse in, in, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, uh, starting to talk about banks, because m uh, many people in Bosnia and Herzegovina are heavily indebted, uh, concerning, um, uh, especially uh, concerning uh, this um, uh, household credits, and they're heavily indebted uh, as the small firms. Uh, there are, of course, still this big state-owned firm as, as Telecom and and uh, and uh, Electro Distribution, uh, in which people have good salaries. But as I said, they, they are they are in some in some position of, of being clients of political parties. 
but uh, uh, most of the people in Bosnia and Herzegovina are surviving for perhaps 400 euro per month, uh, and uh, they are all indebted in in, in different credits, uh, being that um, uh, credits for 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 being that household credits or credits for anything for their small businesses or or, or so on. So we started to talk about. Uh, uh, regulation of banks in Bosnia and Herzegovina. The banking sector is ruled by oligopoly of the of the mainly Austrian banks, Raiffeisen uh, Sparkasse, German Austrian, German Austrian banks, and uh, uh, the the point of interest interest goes uh, even to 14 percent sometimes, from 8.3, 9.3 to to, to even 14 percent, and we started to to, to uh, uh, speak about policy of regulating banks, and of course uh, about need uh, of founding a Bosnian central bank. There there is a Bosnian central bank, but it is powerless uh, 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 comparing to to, to, to this. Uh, as also also the the there are regulatory. Uh, agencies for uh, for banks on the entity levels, but they are also working in interest of, of of this of these foreign banks. So we started to talk about that to propose some uh, solutions uh, for the regulation of inter of, of international banks and uh, the founding of the founding of, of the real Bosnian banks. But then uh, we uh, came into the problem, what to do if, if we have this bank and uh, such a level of, of bureaucracy and corruption, what would happen even with that state bank? What would happen? Because uh, there, are so many, there are so many questions in Bosnia without, uh, without solution. Uh, then, then we start to ask ourselves, are we in situation to fantasize, to fantasize really about uh, uh, some kind of solution? that in this situation wouldn't work also. And uh, other, other part of, of, of the fight, of course, along with, with this, with this uh, would be the, as, as I said, the ruling parties in Bosnia and Herzegovina are social democratic, but in, in, the, in their party uh, programs are just privatizations, privatization, privatization. Then we also said, okay, we, we need to, to, to have a program and strategy to fight against it. Uh, then, of course, bureaucracy is also a problem uh, because there is a large antagonism between uh, people working in this bureaucracy and uh, people working in the private sector with uh, misery law, with, which, with salaries which are total misery comparing to, to people working in bureaucracy. So there is a large antagonism. What to do in, in that case? Of course, uh, uh, the bureaucracy, uh, uh, we, we must also fight with, with, with this bureaucratic monster, but also we, have, uh, we, we need to have in mind that, that many people uh, 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 can't have another job, so they are working in bureaucracy, and that's it. Uh, because th there is no uh, large state policy of, of of industrialization or anything that would bring jobs. So the the the, the, the also the people who are working in bureaucracy are also uh, some kind enforced to work. For example, if if you are finishing uh, your faculty that is for perhaps uh, humanistic or something else, uh, you cannot find a job and only through some uh, connection which you have with certain people from certain party you can have a job in bureaucracy and you're not guilty for not having it in, in, in any other place because it doesn't exist. And so, so, uh, how, uh, so, so we started to think uh, how, how to explain people that this antagonism is false antagonism and that, uh, that the politicians and uh, and this new bourgeoisie that, that that appeared from the war in in Bosnia Herzegovina, they are using these antagonisms to, to to their own benefits. Uh, that is another strategy. And uh, how and mainly, of course, how to organize the working class, because the working class is organized in syndicates that are totally controlled by also by political parties. There are two uh, two big syndicates, one in Federation and one in Republika Srpska. But they are, as I said, totally under control of, of, of the political parties and, and bureaucracies. So the, 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 the 
one of the strategies for us is to how uh, how to organize uh, how to propose organization of working class on the other levels and not this this uh, state syndicate because which are totally corrupted there is a famous a sentence of uh, of the president of the syndicate in federation of bosnia and herzegovina when when he was asked uh, uh, whether there will be uh, 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 protests for the May Day, for the May Day, and he said, "No, it is not in our tradition to protest." <laughs> so it, it's it's uh, it's uh, the, the Bosnia is is I, I think the, the 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 people who write satire would lose their job in, in Bosnia. It, it it is totally uh, it, is, it is the state it is the state with with the. I think most contradictions in, in, in whole Europe, with uh, unsolved national question, unsolved this kind of memory question, unsolved uh, problems of 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 of, uh, of economy, of of uh, anything. That that means uh, that uh, the left in Bosnia, this new, and there are two tendencies now. Uh, our one is ours, and others is the newly founded left party called the left. Okay, who <laughs> called the left? I'm sorry, I, I just I just need one more minute. Call the left, and uh, uh, we we try in this confusion to find a proper strategy to to found to found a new a new left wing movement in Bosnia, which uh, would finish with all this nationalistic nonsense, patriotic patriotic nonsense, and come back to the to the working class as a base, or as, as our political base. Thank you. Thank you, Vuk. Um, and I will... The other Vuk. Yeah. <laughs> the other Vuk, yeah. Okay, well, uh, I'll try to speak uh, briefly about the economics in Serbia, since uh, both Tip and Vuk, I mean, and these of the Croatian comrades have already covered much of the problems, uh, because they are basically similar to the, uh, the Croatian uh, situation. Uh, Okay, so, uh, I mean, uh, the, the new liberal transition in Serbia has brought uh, some of these effects which have already been mentioned. So, on one hand, we've had uh, privatization, and uh, which uh, I think fi more than 50% of privatizations are what they uh, say are unsuccessful. Basically, all the companies that have been privatized, more than 50 of them, have been <coughs> uh, totally destroyed. Uh, the workers have been either sacked from their jobs or they haven't uh, received any wages for years. So it, it's completely unknown what they are living of and how they are they still alive and did not die of hunger. Uh, so that's on the one hand. On the other hand, uh, the companies which have not been destroyed by privatization, I mean completely destroyed, have mostly been uh, sold off. So basically they sold off uh, buildings or factories, they sold off the land, so that they could uh, accumulate more, more and more capital. Uh, the entire uh, capital in Serbia is maybe in hands of 15 to 20 people. Uh, so it's very uh, centralized in that sense. Uh, uh, the companies that have been privatized and are still uh, sort of working uh, have mostly served the Serbian capitalists as the basis for taking more credit, uh, again, to uh, accumulate and buy other companies that would then again give them the opportunity to accumulate even more money. Uh, another thing has been because Serbia has kept Dina, its national uh, uh, currency, thank you. Uh, and what has been happening from the moment uh, of, uh, after the, the year 2000, uh, the value of the dinar has dropped constantly in relation to the euro. So what that has meant for uh, the Serbian people is, uh, firstly, the loss of value in, of wages, which has constantly been falling uh, in reality, even if it's, it, it nominally stayed the same. Uh, the other effect has been uh, a rise of prices, which is spiraling even more and more out of control. Uh, so we have seen from 2005, maybe, a massive, massive uh, loss of living standard. Uh, the living standard has dropped massively. Uh, and we have seen uh, popularization on all levels, except, of course, the highest level. Uh, so, uh, uh, another thing is because uh, of the, these dynamics, uh, uh, even the foreign direct investments since the beginning of the crisis have stopped. So the only money that is now circulating in the Serbian economy is credit. There are not, not even uh, uh, the direct foreign investments anymore, and credit is the only lifeblood of the Serbian economic system. 
uh, the way uh, the government tries to uh, cover the budget deficit is mostly by taking the credits from uh, take, taking credits from the IMF, which of course then the IMF uh, imposes certain uh, conditions if we were to take that uh, that credit, which is of course called uh, economic restructuring. Which uh, I think Steve has talked about that. Uh, well, uh, <coughs> so uh, uh, the restructuring of the economy has led to these privatizations, to the, the destruction of, of companies. Since the crisis began, there has been mass unemployment. I think in the last year only uh, 300,000 people have lost their jobs. The others which are employed are mostly employed uh, in the public sector, uh, which is, of course, as in Bosnia, tied to, the, uh, uh, to uh, party affiliations. And the others which are working in the private sector uh, have, I think, the, the lowest, uh, the worst conditions uh, there have been in Serbia for, for work. On one hand, uh, union organizing has been banned in the private sector. So workers which uh, try to, which apply for jobs in the private sector have to sign stating that they will not be a member of any union or any, work, any working uh, organizations. And on the other hand, uh, uh, jobs are so precarious that they are being uh, uh, sacked from their jobs for the smallest mistakes, for the smallest lack of discipline. So it's it's just circuiting because you have the official rate of unemployment. I think is 25 percent, but it's even more. And there is a huge uh, 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 army of labor which is waiting for a job. So it's not that hard to just sack somebody and have somebody new. Yeah. Uh, 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 speaking of the banks, uh, I think uh, the, the uh, largest singular uh, uh, capital in the Serbian banks is Greek capital. And since the Greek crisis has began, and uh, concerning the, the scale of it, that has also uh, had an effect on Serbia. So uh, what, we have, what, what we have at the most basic level is uh, that the credits for households and for the economy in general, I mean for the industry, are uh, even harder to get now. The interest rate, uh, rates have risen, and it's basically today in Serbia it is impossible for a household and for a company as well to uh, keep on either living or, do it or doing business uh, without constantly being in some sort of, uh, of debt. Uh, <coughs> Uh, also, uh, uh, speaking politically, uh, uh, it is not the same with the economic crisis as it has been in other uh, per, uh, economies of the periphery. So while uh, you have uh, budget cuts, for example, in Slovenia and Croatia and Romania and basically the whole region, the economic crisis seems to be going around Serbia in a way. I mean, okay, yes, it had its effects. Yes, the effects are felt. Uh, they can be seen. But it is not so explicit as in the case of some other countries. So, for example, we have we did, did not have budget, budget cuts in, in the typical sense when the government says, "Okay, now the wages are 10 percent; uh, 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 they are cut by 10 percent. Uh, the, the pension fund is smaller." No, uh, the only way uh, they have been cutting that is been very clever. Uh, they have been doing it in such a way that nobody can actually see what the hell is going on. And as Tipa said. Uh, there is nothing in the newspaper uh, which speaks of the economics situation. So you can know that there, that there are budget cuts only if you know about the, about the budget cuts in advance. So for example, when, when students want uh, lower tuition fees, when they want more, uh, more funding for the, uh, for the uh, education, they don't say we don't have money because we have to cut. No. They say we don't have money because Serbia is a poor economy. And that's it. So the only way to try to see through these political issues and see the economic, uh, 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 economic reasoning behind it is if you know about the economic reasoning in advance. So it, it, it's basically the whole economic question is not so uh, explicitly visible. It uh, has been mediated and it is now mostly seen through the, uh, 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 the prism of the national question. So all the economic questions are either put politically or nationally. And the economic crisis has, has, has actually, in a way, spilled over to become a political crisis and a crisis of governmental uh, legitimacy. So now, actually, <coughs> nobody even believes uh, the, 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 the election promises that they have been putting. Nobody actually, even in the elections, tries to tackle these economic and social, social issues. So if the left today in Serbia wants to engage these economic questions, it has to engage them uh, via the national question, 
via political crisis, it cannot, at least for the moment, uh, engage them directly as it is the case in many other European, European countries. So uh, what this crisis, the political crisis and the crisis of uh, legitimacy has brought is a growing wave of state repression. Uh, so in order to try to uh, push through all these cuts in the budget and so on, they do it very thoroughly, you don't know that they're doing it, uh, they need even more and more repression. So everywhere where, the, where there is some sign of resistance, uh, the police always intervenes, the police always crushes the protest, and it is, we believe, the main question of the day, it is sort of a key link in the chain. And if you grab that link, you can gain, you gain control over the whole chain of political events. And we think that is uh, 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 state repression, on the one hand. On the other hand, uh, there is, of course, the assistance of right-wing groups uh, uh, to the state. So when we had the, the, uh, the student occupations, it, we were not only repressed by the state, we were also repressed by right-wing groups. When uh, agricultural workers tried to block the roads to Belgrade in, by that, in, in that way protesting, there, there was not only police repression, there was also uh, hooligans coming out from their black cars and smashing their, their, their vehicles. So, uh, uh, and that coincides with, uh, with the rise of the right wing in Europe generally and especially in Serbia. So I would agree what has al already been said that the left today has to tackle these issues of nationalism and in Serbia uh, there has not only been a rise in extreme nationalism, the standard sort that we've, we've kind of get, I mean, that we, we, we kind of know, uh, there has also been a rise of some kind of, of, of fascism that is different from the standard nationalism that we got, that we got used to, that we know. Uh, so basically in very short uh, 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 points, what we've been trying to do is try to tackle the question of repression, try to uh, engage and uh, uh, link all these progressive movements, these movements that are fighting for their rights, which has been systematically repressed now, and uh, try to link, link them all, because there is not much working class struggle in Serbia, especially organized working class struggle. I mean, uh, the whole class has been declassed. We don't have many industrial workers. The unemployed are the actually the biggest mass of, of, uh, of the uh, population, and the unions are basically tied in with the government so tightly that they don't even speak anymore. So what we've been trying to do is to make a political movement not starting from the working class initially directly, but from other groups and then bringing the, the politics into the workers and try to politicize them and link them with other groups and, of course, with us. So I would, uh, if there is time, if, the, if there is will, Sava will say a, a few words about... Yeah, but briefly, please. Very briefly, very briefly, of course. <laughs> uh -huh. Okay, I will translate what he says in Serbian. So. Dobro, nije sreće, rekao da mi smo postavili svoju platformu koja se zove, koja se nazvali pravo na protest. Ok, so we have established a platform that we call the right to protest. Da želimo pozdati progresivne snage u jednom objedinjenu... Da želimo pozdati progresivne snage u jednom ujedinjenu stanu koja će se boriti protiv represije i ošte zabrane protesta. Dakle, u poslednjih par godina imali smo zabranu protesta Molinara, traktorista, odnosno seljaka koji su pokušali da dođu u Belgrad. So, every time somebody from the, from other cities tries to come to Belgrade, they basically lay a siege on the city that is in question. They don't let anyone out. For example, Pancho, which is near Belgrade, it was entirely under siege when they tried to come to Belgrade. Zato što Belgrad predstavlja jednostavno medijski centar uošte u prostoru Srbije i za mnoge proteste koji se dešavaju u centru van Belgrada, niko ne zna, zato što mediji jednostavno zapire. The media doesn't really what is happening outside of Belgrade. Dakle, ove godine je i Pride. The Pride March has been also banned this year. It didn't take place. Kao što je već Vuk rekao, desnica aktivno pomaže državi u rušenju i uništavanju protesta. The right has been actively supporting the state in silencing protests. Naprimjer, 
U poslednjih par meseci da su se par napada na vođe sindikata. Jedan od većih napada je kamenovanje kuće sindikalnog vođe iz Jugova Remedije. So even union leaders which are not so loud as they maybe should be are being attacked by the right independently of the state. Tako da je cilj ovo što ove platforme pravo na proces da se blagovremeno reaguje. The goal of the platform is to react in time to these cases of oppression. Stvaranje štita depresije i stvaranje progresivnog pokreta koji se može samo artikulisati. Building a shield against repression until we have a sword against it and building a political movement to react to all these problems. I u platformu pravo na proces uključujemo Pored radnika, dakle, i nacionalne manjine, odnosno prvenstveno Rome, pošto su u Beogradu učestvala raseljavanja iz ilegalnih nasilja, odnosno neregistrovnih nasilja. Ok, so we were trying to, under the roof of this platform, to put together not only workers, but also LGBT organization, national minorities and Roma, uh, Roma people especially because they have been subject to great racism and uh, repression in the last couple of, of years. So we're trying to even to cooperate with the liberals uh, to that point to the, well, they want to cooperate with us. Thanks. And for the last presentation, I'll ask Tony who will give some 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 directions there for left rethinking. We'll call it the not so modest proposal. So yes, I really want to start. I don't think it's time for modest proposals at all. It's the wrong way to approach the crisis in this moment. If we're in agreement, and most people are, that it's, it's perhaps the second largest crisis in, in a century for capitalism, then we should act accordingly. And that means that our action and analysis has to be on several levels, but I would say three are the most important ones. One is the level of building the mass movements and, and organizations capable to uh, instill and lead the change in society on multiple levels, like you said, working with middle earth when needed and convincing them even uh, it's hard work, but it's possible, as we've seen. And on the other hand, the uh, institutions. And when I mean institutions, I mean not just the state institutions, but I mean on macro level, a uh, combination of political and economic sphere in one sphere. This is the time where we can do so. I mean, it, the opportunities are clear. Uh, so the great liberal separation between the political and the ownership of the property and the means of production, which has been so successful as a discourse for a century, I think we have a good chance to break it. Uh, 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 on the third level, so that's, a, that's almost the national level of, of struggle, and on the third level, the South-South question that was mentioned yesterday, I think is also a fantastic way to open up a discourse and a debate that EU is not the only way how countries can unite in Europe to work across borders on the basis of solidarity. Alba is a good example, so is the foreman, uh, example is informed in the Soviet bloc. Uh, but all of these arguments should not be modest, they should be radical, they should instill fear, like I said yesterday. I do believe that internal banking, that can be simply wiped by you know, a pen or a computer delete button once it's in our hands. But all of this, of course, has to be done with a high, high dose of plausibility and analytical con uh, uh, conviction. I mean, it, it can't be done with you know, demand for a better world, which has uh, uh, been uh, the problem for, for decades, for, for left, I think, uh, since, in the, especially the last 20 years since we lost uh, uh, any sort of institutional uh, power in Europe. So, uh, when we mention here in discussions things like uh, uh, human needs, i.e. the use value, the political economy of use value, as I call it, um, Catherine was yesterday saying that uh, uh, we should put those demands forward if, if we are going to discuss even the possibility of South South. Uh, 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 uniting on what basis should we unite? What should be our demands? I think that our demands has to be such that the policy recommendations can be made based on those demands. So they have to be macroeconomic and they have to be macro-political. Uh, 
with the great demand for uh, developed last several years across the world, and I've seen developing since Seattle, since the globalization movement, and, and later through social forms, there was a great demand from for direct action, direct democracy, you know, the, the old anarchist traditions and the old traditions of the left to, to, to ask for democratic rights. I mean, now is the moment for us to say that it's not enough anymore to push back for uh, asking for our voice to be heard democratically, simply one voice, you know, one vote. Uh, it's the time to ask, to connect it with economic question and to say only those who have certain material conditions in their living met by the state or by the whatever greater macro macroeconomic uh, uh, entity provide this only those can be equal in decision making and in participation in, in, in discussion because obviously if you don't have the ability to educate if you don't have the care for the old for the kids you know there are so many class stratifications that are that are imposed by commodity form uh, so I think one thing what we could do is try to measure back the neoliberal the, you know we should meet the neoliberal demand for measure but measure back and measure back on our own on our own uh, on our own ground so to say and that's the um, I call those objects the o o egalitarian objects or the objects of communism when I'm amongst comrades and egalitarian objects when I'm amongst liberals <laughs> um, and these are the, so any entity in society that spreads egalitarian relations is an object is an egalitarian object in the same way like commodity form and capital spread the unequal relations. Uh, put it simply, health, education, care for the old, care for the children, uh, social services that are so, so well developed last last several decades, in, especially in Western Europe where it had to defend itself from the threat of the East and it had to do a lot of things to, to uh, uh, silence or uh, make peace with their large unions. Uh, UK is a great example of, of a historic uh, cleverness of on part of liberals and conservatives how to deal with labor movements. Uh, in 2005 and six, there was a big change both on the EU level and in, in UK in terms of attempts of, uh, in a very neoclassical way, to measure the output of health, education, care, pensions. So anything that's not a commodity that's provided according to need. If you're ill, you go to hospital, you get cured. That's how it is in the UK still. Uh, but not for long. So they're trying to provide ways to measure this, but in a neoclassical way. So in a way that has a marginal utility in built at the end of it, you know, that, that treats us all as consumers. And like Maya was saying, that makes, that forces us to sell our labor to capital in order to be able to pay for something that was in social democratic times of Europe, more social democratic than today, or even though not, not very, very democratic ever. In those times, it was provided according to need. Um, and it still is in some countries. So I think we have to provide a framework to measure those things in ways which will show literally in statistics and in, uh, you know, in, in a way that policy can be formulated, in a way that we can say we would run the country in these ways, and this is why we would measure the output of... of uh, and this output is not anymore cost. That was mentioned somewhere yesterday. I don't know who mentioned it. Maybe I think John Wicks mentioned it. We can't anymore say we have to... Uh, uh, even, I mean, the national statistics of UK 2005, Atkinson report says clearly the state spends half of the money spent in the country. It is productive. It is not, uh, uh, it is not, you know, spending of the money that was earned somewhere else. Even FT, you get pieces. I mean, I've got a couple of pieces in, in FT, say, which actually say this. No, these times I'm gone. This is not productive. We can't have this separation on the balance sheet, earnings and cost. So the provision of state services, especially they are called integralitarian need, is not anymore cost. Uh, it is productive. Yeah, okay, so I'll wrap it up because it's my seven minutes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, measure. Uh, so to put it in a in, in few sentences, uh, we need to develop demands for egalitarian production of egalitarian value in society, which spreads egalitarian relations, and I think that macroeconomics or national statistics is a great way to enter this debate and to provide an alternative view of state economy, which will show that the state sector is productive, that cares of the old, of children, hospital, nurses, teachers, that they are all productive. How are they productive? How are we going to use them as our argument for different restructuring of uh, political demands? 
and of course the person that has to work two jobs that cannot afford uh, uh, to participate in what we're doing. I mean, this is a huge privilege, let's not have a doubt. I mean, the, the most, most activism in UK is more and more becoming. If it ever was a working class thing, it was a big privilege of the middle classes and upper middle classes. So we have to connect these economic demands and say, no, in order to have a true democratic society, we cannot anymore allow one vote, one, uh, uh, one voice in the parliament. And so on micro level, yes, direct democracy, yes, on macro level, demand for that democracy to be possible through egalitarian objects, that spread egalitarian relations. Uh, so it's a lot of hard work, it's not a modest demand at all, but I think it's much more plausible that in decades to come, it's, de it's project for decades, not for years, we can do something like this rather than convince the ruling classes that they stop doing, like Varoufakis is asking, what they've been doing for 50 years, which is trying to make conditions for capital uh, a more uh, 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 capital friendly in Europe, so to say. So, I mean, this Europe has been designed in 19, you know, after the Marshall Plan, 1948, 49, 50, and it, it's, not, it's not a neoliberal Europe from yesterday. Neoliberalism is a name that we gave it based on certain schools of thought, but it's been here for a long, long, long time. And Varoufakis demands literally saying, let's change Europe for at least at minimal 50 years, because demands that we see today on the level of Brussels, independence of the Central Bank, are demands from 48, 49, and 50, and it's clear if you read the history of it. So that's it, thanks. Uh, thank you all. Yeah, I will open now the general debate. Uh, so I see there. <laughs> Sorry, I, I don't want to uh, block the discussion on, on other things, but there are two issues that were raised in the, dis uh, in the discussion which I think are particularly central to uh, to, uh, to, to the summer school and to, to the issues that concern us uh, very much. First of all, in connection with, um, uh, let me start off with what Tony said. Uh, it seems to me that the struggle for the protection of the welfare state is very, very important. The role of the welfare state in Western Europe and in Eastern Europe actually has a different history and as Tony pointed out um, what uh, or I um, he alluded to the the welfare state in Western Europe uh, was the result of competition with, with communism but it was also a compromise that was entered into by the middle classes the middle classes who had been made very very insecure by what happened in the 1930s when they lost their savings and they saw the political system, the bourgeois political system, falling apart uh, in uh, a, a torn between the left and the fascists uh, 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 and so on. So the, the welfare state was, uh, was their compromise to give themselves economic security and uh, in ex uh, themselves and the working class economic uh, security to keep is uh, the, uh, uh, the political system stable. What happened since the 1980s, and this has particularly affected Western Europe, is the rise of uh, the housing market as the welfare state of the middle classes. The middle class in Western Europe no longer rely on the state system of welfare provision. The state system of welfare provision is for the poor, and for, uh, um, for those who cannot do this privately. So this is a very, uh, uh, this is a very particular background to the, the, the problems of the welfare state in, in Western Europe. In, in Eastern Europe, the, uh, of course, the, the welfare system is associated with, with communism. And this is, brings me on to my second point, which is that the uh, what makes the struggles in Eastern Europe, um, uh, Eastern Europe, the Balkans, parts of Central Europe, different to the ones in the West is the issue of nationalism. Uh, nationalism which we don't have in, in, in Western uh, Europe, well of course except for kind of regional, uh, f uh, uh, you know, the Lombardy League or the uh, regional issues in, in, in Spain. Uh, and I wonder if, if in, you have here, you, we're dealing with 
maybe two types of nationalism. Um, one is the nationalism which was mentioned by the speakers earlier, which sees uh, Brussels as the answer to everything and wants, uh, uh, wants an alliance uh, with Brussels because they hate their neighbours and they think if they're good friends with Brussels this will make them stronger in relation to their neighbours. Uh, or, or, and, or and a different type of nationalism which is the exclusive kind of uh, a nationalism where uh, you say no, Brussels have been, has been corrupted by secularism, uh, you know, even modest welfare state provision. We want to go back to the traditional tribal religious community. Uh, uh, and that, that one in particular associated with, um, uh, with the, uh, the attacks on the Roma uh, and uh, a, a, a minorities. I wonder if this kind of, if it's possible to distinguish those types of uh, uh, nationalisms and whether this affects the political strategy for the left. Well, I, excuse me, can I, I have uh, an answer to this question, which is, of course, uh, only an intu uh, intuitive, uh, but I would say that this second uh, type of nationalism, which is ra racism, actually, yeah. is a common thing in both in Western and uh, Eastern Europe, uh, even numerically, I would say, statistically, uh, it is uh, as, as powerful in the, the West as is, it is in the East. Whereas the second one, yes, is probably uh, more uh, the problem of the of the Eastern Europe, but uh, because of uh, the state building in these parts of, of Europe, because uh, you don't have modern states, uh, modern nations in Western Europe that would not have state, whereas uh, now you don't have uh, modern nations in Europe that would, uh, in Eastern Europe uh, that would not have a state as well. But uh, for instance, fifty or hundred years ago you did have so this is so that this is the endogenous kind of nationalism whereas the second one which is racism is probably universal so mm -hmm. well <coughs> I think that um, well maybe there is a third aspect maybe to this um, and it, it has been mentioned in, in debates on the, on the first day but if you look at well, for one, yes, the, the elites, the nationalist elites, but for Croatia, uh, for example, this nationalism, it was also, um, of course, um, um, it always was connected to, uh, to this question of return uh, to Europe. So uh, we could, you know, if, if we wanted to analyze it, it's, it's contradictory in itself. So at the same time, uh, as it proclaims uh, sovereignty uh, and uh, on, uh, on the political level, and also, of course, wants to cut the relations, economic relations, uh, uh, with the former Yugoslav republics, which were then, you know, the developed uh, republics like Slovenia and Croatia, uh, uh, in the uh, end game uh, um, phase of of the Yugoslav uh, of the Yugoslav Federation, of course, there was this uh, already racist um, uh, racist discourse that that the eastern uh, poorer republics are uh, par uh, parasites uh, and that the, the western more developed are, are the are the productive ones, and you know why? Why should they? Uh, why should uh, they um, have these free riders uh, 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 you know, uh, dragging them uh, back into into the Balkans and Balkans into the war? So there, are, of course, I mean, there are, um, I don't think that there are uh, ideology. Usually, isn't very um, in that sense uh, logically coherent. It's uh, inherently opportunistic in that sense. So, uh, but what I would say, what the great, what I see as, as the great danger is basically. Um, Yes, this, this type of na nationalism which doesn't need to be explicitly nationalist anymore because, uh, because everything that the nationalists uh, hoped for can now be translated into a, into, a, into a discourse of European integration. And so you don't have much of, of, of a nationalist sentiment in, in Croatia basically uh, as, as a... It's not really a relevant... Um, uh, it, it, it has evaporated very, very quickly at one point. You know, that is what uh, probably what people from the West... I mean, you don't have... Uh, even the uh, HDZ, like uh, uh, Tuchman's party, they don't rely on, 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 on nationalist or anti-Serb rhetorics uh, anymore. So you don't have that. You have the uh, th that has been more or less confined uh, to the uh, to fractions of the radical right. You, they, they are the ones uh, 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 holding up that that project, that aspect of of um, uh, of the project. So I would say 
Yes, uh, there has been a split. Uh, uh, the mainstream nationalists have now all become uh, pro-Europeans because they see that as a continuation of their project, you know, becoming uh, integrating into Europe, uh, uh, leaving the Balkans behind. And then you have, um, uh, of course, the, the, uh, uh, the hardcore right, which is it, it is marginal in, in Croatia, uh, for Dow still marginal, and uh, they are uh, um, they are continuing with this. Uh, with this uh, proto-fascist, you know, this romantic, uh, romantic myths about, uh, uh, um, and part of this, well, Europe is already corrupted, and, and they are going to push us back again into into this um, uh, obscene brothel, which is uh, the EU, and then, and, and of course they pick up them uh, uh, bits and pieces of of, of left criti critiques of, of imperialism, you know, uh, uh, so you have this ideological cocktail. In that sense, I don't think it's it's very relevant now. But that does not mean that it, uh, it won't uh, won't become uh, that it cannot explode again. Uh, uh, you know that it can become a mainstream as it was in the 90s to, to a certain extent. Once the EU uh, project uh, uh, reaches a point of ideological uh, crisis of, of a crisis of legitimation, so if Croatia enters the European Union and within five or six years, uh, uh, things uh, continue deteriorating. And you know, once that uh, project gets into crisis, but well then, uh, uh, then I, I, I'm afraid you know, then you, uh, uh, that the danger is that we, we will uh, have something like we're witnessing in Hungary you now. Mm -hmm. And uh, but it's you know, but it's not only the eastern part. You know, in Finland, you have like the, the party of the new Finns and, and uh, what not, you know. And, and in the Netherlands, in, in Denmark, it's, it's uh, uh, France. We have already been discussing. So I think it's a. Um, I agree that yes, in Eastern Europe it's probably more complex and uh, more dangerous. But the social situation is, uh, you know, the, the social ferment is is uh, is simply uh, more more toxic in that sense. But I think it's it's a it's a, it's a general problem. Uh, yes. Uh, well, uh, in answer to your question, how does it well, well actually does it affect the strategies left? I think it does because uh, <clears throat> the second nationalism you've mentioned is uh, in Serbia is. For example, uh, even uh, demanding reforms to the banks. So it's a very dangerous cocktail, ideological cocktail, uh, uh, on the one hand, to serve economic solutions, uh, solutions, uh, and to serve, for example, uh, the rhetoric of uh, the EU being destructive for the Serbian family, the Serbian way of life, and so on. Uh, so it, it affects the, 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 the left strategy because I think it uh, requires us then to engage not only economic questions. I think it uh, requires us to engage all the questions that uh, the right uh, engage. I mean, for example, I think that uh, 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 partly uh, the reason <coughs> why Mélenchon did not succeed so well in his campaign because he focused uh, too little on the other questions. I think his, his focus was too much on the economic questions, which is, ju which is justified, but to, I think today, especially vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis the the second part, the second version of nationalism, we need to focus on all questions as broad as we as we can, and not only on economic solutions for for the crisis. Okay, and James, you want to ask something? Yeah, I wanted to say this thread a little bit, but if there are other people. Okay. Um, is there? Uh, I would like to make uh, one comment and maybe also a question. Uh, what? Hi. Yeah. <coughs> Uh -huh, sorry, I didn't. Yeah, <laughs> I just want to add a few words on the housing questions that Tiana uh, opened. I think it's a very, very interesting, uh, useful formulation to put the housing market on as a uh, welfare, welfare institution of the middle class. I just like to add it's a middle class that's becoming a lumpen middle class, at least in Eastern Europe, uh, because traditionally or in socialism, to become a middle class, obviously, you couldn't become uh, remain middle class by owning uh, means of production. So it was through um, through employment as a civil servant, uh, for example, as a college or university professor or a judge or a doctor. And th this was the, let's say, so sociological composition of middle class in, in socialism. And this same middle class now, now faces explicit government ban on employment in the public sector, so it cannot reproduce itself, this traditional. So you have these new riches, new new private businessmen, but let's say this traditional uh, type of uh, um, uh, post-socialist middle class is unable to reproduce itself, so it has to rely 
uh, to a large extent to the real estate it, it owns. And uh, um, I think it's important to talk about housing questions in the context of neoliberalism because privatization of social housing is one of the basic pillars of neoliberal policies. It was implemented in all the Eastern European states and uh, even before or at the same time also also in the in the in Western Europe and basically in Slovenia when it was privatized in, in it was with the same argumentation that Margaret Thatcher used in, in her uh, privatization of, of council estate in in the United Kingdom. So it was basically to to discipline the working class on the one hand. So this famous saying of Margaret Thatcher, you won't have rights in the neighborhood where uh, workers own, own their, uh, their apartments. And on the other hand, there was this rhetoric of democratization of, of, of uh, housing, democratization of access to small property ownership and, and so on, this equity, this whole equity, equity culture. But in, in actual reality, this uh, real estate ownership, this so for small scale, real estate ownership became concentrated in the hands of uh, people who had enough Deutsche Mark saved in the 90s to, to purchase a large amount of real estate. So there was no democratization but concentration of this private private real estate ownership that now serves pre precisely the, that function as a um, welfare net of the last resort for the middle class that's becoming lumpen middle class basically. Yeah. Um, I would like to make a comment what uh, Tony was talking about because uh, um, in uh, Slovenia in, at the 18th uh, of April was a, a very big strike of the public sector and the public sector now is using also a little bit of your argumentation for defending public sector because uh, they are saying uh, the same thing, the public sector, the service that uh, are produced uh, to the public sector are not only um, services, are not commodities, uh, and uh, he's talking, uh, they are using also all the time that uh, it's uh, very important to, uh, to um, keep uh, the public uh, all services uh, because they are, uh, they are in the name of uh, equality uh, and that uh, also they are using um, that it is uh, added value. Added value. That, that is the added value of public sector and that is the very uh, important added value of public sector. So um, the problem only it is that uh, here in Slovenia that uh, trade unions are, uh, are not using that for politicization. Because, for example, uh, at this moment uh, the only, um, only some uh, um, uh, okay, I, I don't even know if it's possible for trade unions to say that they are left, uh, but they are of course left because they are for workers. Uh, and uh, here it's only one mm, that uh, biggest problem is that uh, sin, uh, trade unions are not using that as a uh, don't call it as uh, their activity and they sp their speak also. And uh, what I wanted to say also, because uh, uh, in other countries, I don't know, because um, right now the, in Slovenia the biggest issue is a pressure on public uh, uh, services and on the public sector mostly. Um, and uh, there is nothing uh, in these budget cuts and all, everything is uh, on the public sector mostly. There is nothing talking about uh, any private sector or, the, or about privatization or banking systems, but that is the mo the biggest agenda is right now uh, these pressures. So, and I noticed uh, that in other countries, I don't know, in Serbia, Bosnia, Croatia, I know, uh, they are not uh, so uh, um, making any um, discourse about that and any because I know Serbia have also a very large uh, public sector. As far as I know, but there, there haven't been any any job cuts, any large scale job cuts. Cuts. I mean, there have been people which have been laid off, but not in a very large scale because they lose their votes if they do so. A lot of those people are employed uh, through the party affiliation line, and then if they just cut this public sector so widely, they will lose their already unstable uh, le uh, legitimacy. Just like in most large public sectors still existing. 
And there has not yeah. been any resistance in the public sector, even though there have there have been some taxes on wages, but it's it's, it's been very hidden and it's not so it's not so large as in some other countries. The so the thing that I didn't say I didn't go in detail, but maybe not because you said that body. So what neoclassical uh, uh, tornado has done since fifties, basically since Samuel is on Tucson the famous book and the, the famous Chicago School of Law and Economics work together. They argued that, the main argument was we don't need democracy as we have it today. It doesn't really matter. And Walter Lippmann wrote the famous books about the public opinion, creation of public opinion, saying let's just say we do democracy, but actually what we do is marginal utility. What they said was when you buy something, you vote with your wallet. You know, the famous, that's the famous phrase in public. But actually what they said is that it allocates resources at the places where they are needed most by us people, so we all vote with our, you know, with our decisions. And so they're trying to do the same thing now in the public sector, of course, with all those services. But then suddenly what, what we, we enter is that through price, pricing the services, pricing the care for the old, for, for kids, for, for hospitals, they are saying this is how we will measure, because there is price, obviously, there will be, demand will be, you know, both democratically and according to actual, you know, what society needs. Uh, what they don't say is that we're moving from allocation according to need, which is the old communist principle, of course. So there's, there was plenty of, if you say, elements of, of communist logic of society, how we wanted to operate in the middle of the West. I mean, UK, the, the National Health Service. You walk in, they don't ask you, and they, didn't, they, do, they, they do ask now. They didn't use, used to ask even for your ID until a few years ago. You just walk in and if you're ill, you get treated. And you get really the top treatment that's available at the time. And they rush you through queues if you're really serious. That was according to me. We on the left didn't have the discourse to phrase this in ways that we can formulate policies. So we were just saying, no, nah, it's just welfare state. No, it's not. You know, welfare state is wrong. You already welfare. No, you know, the terminology has to change, and we have to sh show what kind of values that. How do we? We don't have, you know, price. The old Marx, MCM. Again, we end with M, which has price. So we can't actually strictly use the Marxian framework as it is. We have to go further than Marxian framework. It's a good base, but we can't use it. Therefore, when you say GDP, we always talk GDP. It's the language of the enemy. Every time we say GDP, we say the, cap the development of capitalism has progressed because GDP is flows of goods and capital. Money it doesn't have to be capital. It can be money. It's not capital when it's used in state services. When you pay a nurse, that's not capital. It's money paying for a service. Uh, but I mean, with the growth of GDP equal is growth of demand based on debt. So if the debt has grown immensely, that's in a paper that Catherine left, somewhere left in the, the, there, the copy yesterday, there was uh, three countries she has there. You have an enormous rise in GDP and at the same time, same time, same time enormous rise of debt. That was the bubble that we had in Easter, and, and then every, every, all, all economists were saying, oh, GDP is rising, we're doing well. We are not doing well. You know, it doesn't have to be at all. GDP can simply be that society has been financialized, the household can be in debt. That's growth in GDP. So for us, the task is to go back to very basic macro, macroeconomic questions. And Marxism is not enough. It's good base, but that's not all. I mean, the level it's in the own capital shows really, really well that, that Marx didn't write it book on the state and book on the wage labor and what are the consequences of those tasks not being done back then so i think there's there's plenty of us of, you know to show that value and to show how is that value in balance sheet we can't just say oh it's value because i don't know someone's been cured mm -hmm. there have been in a panel full of, of nine men of nine people that two of them are women and only one of them Asked a question, so please. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I wanted to, to come back on three, three points. Uh, first, um, a basic issue in Eastern Europe and, and especially in the Balkan countries is what has been raised by bonds. Uh, if we can speak about uh, a kind of uh, neocolonization, it's there. And the, the question of, of, uh, of uh, uh, recovering the control on financing needs is a key question. And uh, the priority in the building of uh, that European Union have been push, uh, put on the private financing, uh, foreign direct investment and private banking. But in Eastern Europe, uh, private banking has been combined with the privatization of money itself and of the banking system, 
uh, through uh, sometimes it goes up to 100% of control by the Western Bank. But even when it is uh, not Western Bank, it's privatization of the bank, within the context of what have been the orientation of the banks in the uh, 90s and, and 2000, uh, that is uh, for profit, short term, and that is housing, and, 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 uh, and credits for uh, household who were impoverished, mm -hmm. and, 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 and so uh, a disastrous uh, effect. So I, I do believe, and of course there are also specificities, what you said about Bosnia. I mean, there is even not a central bank in Bosnia. Yes, there is, but... Uh, uh, it is the the formal. There has been a, 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 an incredible article in the, the building of that central bank that uh, 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 the, the, the people uh, uh, managing that bank should not be Bosnians. Should not be Bosnians. <laughs> that was quite important. Uh, and uh, uh, that uh, so-called sovereign Bosnia is, of course, uh, uh, under European and international uh, um, direct control with completely uh, terrible effects. Uh, and there, there is a, 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 a second point I wanted to, 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 to raise. But on, to, to finish on the first aspect of the banking, I, I think there is a general uh, slogan, we must not be uh, we must not deal with this in, in a technical way. We, we must uh, go back to, to fundamental issue. The money for what? What is the the money is both the private and and the public uh, asset, uh, and uh, uh, the the balance sheet of the the privatization of uh, of currency privatization of banks is the banking system is a disastrous disaster for for human beings, especially in Eastern Europe. <laughs> And uh, so that we, we, we must uh, come back on the question of misery, which has been raised yesterday, dignity, fundamental rights uh, for, for having a house, education, health, and the banking system as it functions cannot uh, satisfy this. And at the whole, it's from Greece to, 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 to Bosnia, I mean at the whole level of Europe, the question of a public financing a system in order to satisfy me is, is a really question. So I am uh, and recovering uh, 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 public financing for for fundamental needs is a, is a key question. The second point is on, on Western uh, Western Balkan. Uh, here that uh, we should have also Macedonia, we should have Albanians also in, in the discussion. Um, but I wanted to come on, on what the European Union is dealing with that. Uh, it, it has introduced in 99, at the moment of the Kosovo War, uh, the notion, the so-called notion of Western Balkan. And promise has been done and repeated in Thessaloniki in 2003 Council that all Western Balkans, which are the ex-Yugoslav uh, Republic except Slovenia, which is already in, and Albania, uh, and then, uh, because of uh, the split that is uh, well, now it is Montenegro, Serbia, Bosnia, and there is Kosovo, uh, should be uh, 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 offered sh should be offered to, to be a member of the union. It's bullshit, of course. I mean, but the idea that uh, there is an, uh, a regional problem, not only additional problem and uh, that it cannot be solved case by case, and that there is an integration of national issues and so on, uh, uh, is, a, is a key question. And the, the idea that uh, uh, the integration of the whole region in a, in a bro broader uh, framework we could help solving question is not a stupid idea. It's the whole confederation of Balkan already said that. But the European Union as it is, is incapable of solving this, in offering answers. And there is a contradiction between the offer that the ba Western Balkan should enter the Union and the reality of what is the Union uh, today. But the left has something to say about this. The left has something to say. How do you oppose the rightist currents? Uh, so I don't know, I, I, have no, uh, I have no proposal of more. Uh, but I mean, we, we should really discuss this through, uh, uh, 
in the West we have to, to fight against the use of European uh, slogans in a, in a racist way and in, in uh, uh, well, so we have to, 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 uh, to oppose those who will uh, refuse the integration of the Balkan country because they are poor, they are Balkanic with racist also point of view. Uh, but on the other hand, we have to, to, to try and, uh, uh, answers. Uh, and I think what uh, Maya said in her uh, intervention is a key issue for understanding what happened here in the Balkan region. That is the combination of the destruction of the social ownership of uh, the federation uh, uh, in the transformation into uh, a privatization which had to come through first ethnicization and, uh, and state uh, uh, construction before uh, being able to privatize. Uh, so, but the problem for, for Bosnia and the different people, that is why the national issue is still central. And it's also the case in, in Serbia, is that the etatization uh, 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 through ethnicization in the destruction of the federation can uh, 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 bring the construction of states in uh, Croatia, in Slovenia and elsewhere and even in Croatia it was not so simple but elsewhere you, have, you even have no real state even not to speak of the social state the people cannot recognize themselves in the existing <coughs> state. The constitution of Bosnia has been written in, in data. Yes, that's and one of the annexes of the... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, Macedonia, I don't... I mean, there is no stable state neither, in a way. And uh, in Serbia, neither. To, what, is, what are the frontiers of Serbia, exactly? What is the ownership? And what is the conflict in, uh, uh, about ownership, in, even in Kosovo, is still there? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, uh, this we, well, I don't want to be longer, but I mean, we should have a real systematic discussion and interpretation of that transformation and how do we deal with this. And, and the final point is on, on, on public service. There will be in France, in the middle of May, uh, a conference on health sector. I send it already to, to several of you. Um, I think the issue of education, I said it in the, in the other discussions, the concrete issue of education and of health uh, sector is a, is a key question to develop the idea of uh, satisfaction of fundamental needs and rights. And there, uh, uh, against private ownership and privatization, but with kind of also European uh, solidarity and so on. So I, I, I will send you, it is in English in different language, in German, Ital Italian, Polish and so on. There were already some conferences and uh, of course it, it means transport and difficulty too, but solidarity could exist to finance uh, some trips. And so we should also be concrete on those uh, kind of conference. This is <laughs> yes, but also what is worthy of mentioning in Bosnia as probably in whole ex Yugoslavia is problem with the false opposition to the nationalists. And those are left liberals. Uh, and left liberals in Bosnia are mainly concentrated in two parties, one big and one small, social democratic and so-called Nasha Stranka, it means our, our party. And uh, uh, that is the, the those are uh, right-wing parties that are um, in which the most of their members are not aware that they are in fact also right-wing because there is the much of that self-hate like uh, we are idiots and beasts uh, and only thing we should do is to just to, to, to follow European standards and then and then we will become better and the only solution and, 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 and uh, only alter alternative to what we have is uh, European and Euro Atlant Atlantic integrations and that is what is always and always uh, repeated in opposition against against nationalists but uh, uh, in, in 
in time, in time, it, it it is more and more clear that these options are also partly, or sometimes uh, in majority also nationalistic. That uh, in, in fact, in, in in those parties are many members with, with strongly uh, nationalistic uh, ideology, but uh, from opportunism they enter those parties and then change them and uh, and just. Uh, Putting them in the in the same positions as the as the ex nationalistic parties, so it, it 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 is it is very interesting process. But in the first in Bosnia in the first time after the war, there is a discussion now, and we started this uh, started it in, in in public as a new left tendency of uh, questioning this opposition and uh, uh, this oppo opposition is still very insulted when you confront them and you explain to them that they are also right-wing in, 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 uh, firstly because of their economic policies and uh, it, it is very funny and it is one of uh, indications of, of political illiteracy in Bosnia is that they really uh, honestly found them insulted when you, when you call them right-wing and uh, I think we have uh, now a, sta a tiny, tiny, tiny start of, of, uh, of this process in Bosnia uh, that will, I think, uh, go in direction of creation of, of, of the left alternative that will not, that will not be, uh, that will not have this patriotic or euro and other discourse and focus itself on the, on the rights of the working class. Is there any comment? Okay. Uh, can I take uh, one or two more? Because um, we have to live with Curry. So James and someone else. So there are two things. Quickly to Tony, and to, I think Mislav touched on this as well. I didn't take notes very well, but there's this question. I, I'm, I'm not. I'm not sort of oh, accusing you of this. I'm just sort of putting a little flag in the ground that that I remember Tony. You said you know we also need on the one hand we need the mass movements and on the other hand we also need policies that the left I agree with you completely the left has been lacking you know we need a better world cut it cuts cut spending on defense and spend it on healthcare are not are not sophisticated enough in the current climate we need to do better than that the the problem was that I, and I think this was probably you just speaking shorthand the problem was I sensed a certain kind of um, uh, like almost mechanical way in which you related those things on one hand we need people on the ground on the other hand we need people working out policies but I think the, the, the question about how you build a mass movement is a dynamic one. And so I, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit wary about saying, well, well, on the one hand, we need people that understand economic questions, that understand policy, that understand macroeconomic planning. On the other hand, we need foot, foot soldiers on the ground that can carry those policies and push them through in some way. Because I think, actually, how do you get those mass movements? Well, you need democratic structures. You need spaces in which people can come together and talk about these problems. In some ways, you need a direct demo democratic mechanism where people can actually talk about that. And that's going to mean that those policies that we're developing here, that we're developing in this space, are going to change when we bring them into those mass movements. We're going to have to argue for them, we're going to have to try and carry them through, and sometimes we're not going to win those. Sometimes those are going to ch shift and change depending on contingent circumstances. And so, I think, just a little flag that, that how, we, how we build that mass movement is actually related to the kind of policies we're going to formulate as well. Um, so I'd be interested to know your, your sort of thoughts on that. And, and also just a flag that, you know, it, the, the Labour Party of Australia still has a position that they will socialise all industry and expropriate the capitalists. Of course they're not going to do it. So, I mean, there's a huge discrepancy between the strategy of actually expropriating the possessions of the capitalists and having it on a program and being elected on the basis of it. The, the next question, that, the, and, and particularly also this question of how are we going to do that expropriation? How are we going to carry through these policies? That requires a militant mass movement. That requires us actually confronting capital. Now, that brings me to the next point, which is repression. And, and clearly, if we look at Greece, if we look at what the comrades from Serbia said, we are, we are going to see naked and immediate repression in the periphery. And uh, Mislav said, that the, almost this is the sort of second periphery, I think, the, the, the periphery that's outside of the EMU. And so the question is, what are the strategies that we can use to deal with that? And I think the comrades, the comrades from Serbia have outlined a sort of way of doing that, but there, there are contradictions, there are tensions in that that we're going to have to work with. On the one hand, we have to work with liberals. People have to defend the right to protest, because if we, don't, if we can't defend the right for trade unionists to come out in the streets, to have their strikes, then we have no power. So on the one hand, we do need to defend basic democratic rights and liberties. The contradiction is that requires working with li liberals, which I'm pretty sure across the board in the Balkans are all 
kissing the ass of Brussels, to be quite to be quite blunt about it, right? Like these are people that think everything will be solved when we get in the EU. And of course, at a certain point, those two those two positions are going to be contradictory. And, and I think a book from from Bosnia was saying the right thing that that at some point we are going to have to that th those liberals are going to fall off the edge at some point, you know. And 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 those that are, those that agree with that the process of building a, a democratic world actually means fighting against European integration at a certain point. So we have to sort of be thinking in that direction. The next question was the national question. And, and Vuk, I just wanted to pose to you really quickly. You said, you know, there isn't a solution to the national question that we have in some way. But I also got the sense of, let me put it this way, do you agree that all nationalisms in Bosnia are the same? Because I think it would be, obviously you said this is the most complicated question, the most complicated state in Europe. I think, but I think it would be strange. I think it's. A, I think it's a little too easy to say all nationalism is fucked. We just need to rebuild the working class movement because we've seen the problems that are going to ensue from that. In the case of Serbia, it's it's not sufficient to simply say, well, Albanian nationalism in Kosovo is fucked, and Serbian nationalism in Serbia is fucked. Let's just try and rebuild the working class and not talk about these issues, or just condemn outright all nationalism. Because I think not all nationalisms are equal. And I wonder. My question would be, is is uh, Serbian Bosnian nationalism the Republika Srpska? of the same political quality as Bosniak nationalism in Sarajevo Mostar in the, in the Federation? That would be my mm, concise question. Uh, yes and no. Yes and no. Uh, uh, in the first place, the, the Bosniak nation is young nation. And uh, it is still not developed in that manner. And, it, 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 and I, I would also argue that something as a, a pure Bosniak nation, nationalism doesn't exist. Uh, they are trying, yes. It, it is more, let us say, some kind of, of clerical ideology, but uh, without concrete plan, concrete strategy of what to do. Okay, yes, there is some kind of idea. Uh, idea. Uh, Bosnia is only for Bosnians or Bosniaks, but there is no concrete strategy to, to, to do it, to, to implement that kind of, of policy. And there is no, as, as I said, there is no something as memorandum or something that, 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 that shows the clear marks or pathways uh, how, how to, to come to that. To, to, to that. So uh, I would say that Bosniak nationalism is, is is something uh, uh, like it, it should it should be done in 19th century and it wasn't and, and now in in this reinstallation of capitalism and uh, uh, nationalism with capitalism it developed but it, it is somehow it is somehow without uh, historical context and, and and it is falling apart because you have many people who who who, who don't want who, who just refuse to be bosniaks and say that they are just Bosnians, and uh, it is uh, the, what is uh, what what is interesting is that uh, uh, the, the the people who say for themselves or identify themselves as Bosnia are uh, in most cases uh, mostly religious people. So uh, the name Bosnia uh, connects itself uh, with Islamic community. And Bosnians are more secular or liberal, so it, it is it, it is not Finnish nation. Let us say. And on the other hand, Serb nation nation is let us say Finnish nation, if we can talk in in, in, in that. <laughs> yes, yes, it is it, with the strategy. Yeah. Yes, with the clear with the clear strategy of and a clear national strategy. And in Bosnia, there is a clear Serb national strategy of. Um, independent Republika Srpska. So yes, for now it is impossible because of international constellation, but tomorrow or for five or ten years, who knows? And this uh, mafia ruling in, in, in the Republika Srpska knows uh, that the independence or at least more autonomy is the way to save their asses because they are criminalized and they, they are keeping people in poverty. And uh, now for Dodik and his clique nationalism uh, and national fear and spreading of national fear and hatred is the only only way of of, uh, of remaining in power. So uh, what uh, what is clear it will be happening in next five or five years is increasing of, of Serb and in that case other nationalism nationalism is Bosnia. So we cannot say that yes they are all the same because nothing is the same. We, we, we always must uh, uh, deeper analyze. 
things. But in this case, yes and no, because in future, who knows uh, what will happen for five or ten years in Europe and in the world, and uh, Bosniak nationalism can, in that situation, become the same or even worse. Who knows? Who knows what what what, what is about to come? Tony, briefly, I, I'm glad question wasn't a lot tougher because it was mega giga shorthand. Of course, it's possible to. to I mean, my shorthand was enormous, and of course, that it, it's possible to to have much tougher questions. So, uh, uh, the answer is the. There are two things. Uh, one, precisely our demand for direct participation in governance and in democracy, at, at work if you want to call it, has to coincide with public services saying only a worker who has this and that and housing met as a co social condition of existence can be an equal participant. Now, how not to have food soldiers and not to fall into the old uh, mistake of which, which, which is at least what I'm witnessed in 15 years in England, it's, it's incredibly spread and it's incredibly ingrained in, you know, there'll be five guys on top, they know what to do, they'll read the books, the rest, you go there, call this and shout this. So yeah, I mean, I think we need to learn from that and, you know, and never repeat it because it's not good enough, but for that we need two things. One, three actually, professional cadre, raise funds, you know, deal with the money seriously, you know, understand that we need to talk to, to unions, explain to unions, okay, if what we are doing by clearing the postmoderns out of the way and by connecting the theory with the very concrete issues on the ground, if we are doing this and it's really, you know, enabling unions to make their case stronger because we've done all this work in, in theory and, and uh, especially about clearing out the postmoderns, then we need to ask them for funds. I mean, you know, this is the future. In, you know, in, in UK, we have lab, labor, you know, lab, neoliberal labor party has been funded throughout Blair's years with you know, most extreme neoliberal measures by labor unions because they didn't have the alternative, they didn't have the option and the old way that the small parties of the left were like you said, I'll read the books, you go and hold. So we, we need schools, you know, the old communism always had schools and, and you know, these schools are always about concrete issues about development but back then development was much simpler, you didn't have roads, you didn't have you know, water supply, water <coughs> enough, electricity, plants, it was simpler. Today we have a highly developed society where to connect the needs of development back to the simple question is not as easy. I, I think it's doable, you know, like Catherine was saying, the needs is the basic thing, are the needs of the people, and microeconomic analysis of the needs can be explained. If you can't explain it in simple language, then it's not clear in your own head. And you know, in many, for many theoreticians, you know, they will never take this as a, as a line, but I think it has to be stressed. You know, if you can't explain it to someone in five minutes, then it's not clear for you, go back and study. But schools, funds, regular schools, and be brave and ask unions for the money, and you know, make alliances which are which are uh, uh, bold. So, not 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 modest, but but very well developed and, and argued analytically. Yeah, maybe just a brief point. Uh, I appreciate uh, what you said, James, and I think in fact that situation is even more complicated because as it is now, uh, when you look at the structure of the population. Croatia or any other uh, Eastern European country, you will see that um, because of the process of euroization, uh, almost all of the debts are in foreign currency, and also all of the savings are in foreign currency. And that makes uh, the situation for households extremely difficult. And in fact, I would argue that their material interest is in keeping the status quo as so in keeping the things uh, as they are. Uh, and this is a great, uh, I, I feel this is a great problem and an obstacle for a left strategy, uh, because I think that we from the left uh, usually seriously underestimate these issues mm -hmm. and the way that people on everyday level operate and think. And so uh, creating the mass movement uh, you need, uh, in creating the mass movement, uh, first of all, you need to address this real, material, grounded interest uh, of the working people. That is the, that, that is the first task. And uh, the development of macroeconomic framework, that is a com I feel this is a completely separate issue, okay? uh, in, uh, in theory, of course. Uh, so you, you need to think about, of course, e everything that Tony said, the, the, new measure, the new measurement that will take, the, uh, take into account use values and so yeah. on and so forth. But really, when you look at the situation uh, as it is now, uh, you see uh, that we had like two decades uh, which was characterized by the process of, uh, um, of 
the decline of the middle class. We had middle class back in the socialist system. That is the only time that we actually had a uh, fully functioning middle class, back in the 80s and 1970s. Uh, at, uh, from the beginning of the so-called transition period, uh, we have, we, we've seen the decline of the middle class. So uh, uh, the, all the features that make middle class middle uh, are uh, prog progressively reduced. Consumption and th this entire way of life, actually. This, is, uh, this has been constantly reduced and it is actually a consequence of the macroeconomic policies that were implemented at the, big, uh, at the beginning of the, uh, of the 90s, um, the anti-inflationist policies and so on and so forth. So, um, for me, uh, yeah, the situation in, in bringing together this, uh, how should I put it, a macro strategy and building uh, a mass movement or mass support for uh, socialist values, uh, it, it is an extremely difficult task. You are completely right uh, uh, in trying to put it mechanically, like we need this and at the same time it would be good to have uh, 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 this as well. So, so we need like this grand narrative, and it would be good that if the if, that the people support this grand narrative. Well, yeah, that that would be uh, an an optimal situation. But the reality is far from that. The reality is that uh, I think people in their everyday existence are really um, uh, they identify their lives and their sense of success in life with basically market or capitalist values. And at the same time, uh, so th this has not been addressed properly. And at the same time, um, 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 uh, we lack the, you know, the common narrative, uh, the common le left narrative for the second periphery, for the periphery outside of the Eurozone. And uh, in, uh, in without addressing these separate issues, it, it's, it's really hard to see how the left could pursue uh, to uh, uh, how the left uh, could pursue its radical policies, even if it were in power. So, mm, thank you, Catherine. You want to say yes? Uh, uh, I want Hong Kong to say um, I will leave quite soon now. Uh, I have some uh, uh, remark on the national issue and proposal uh, for the, the future to, to tell you. Uh, on the national issue, I wanted to only to say first that I, uh, I appreciate the yes and no kind of uh, uh, answer, but I, 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 I propose that we distinguish clearly, um, which is not always done even by the left and the Marxist, uh, there are different traditions there, uh, distinguish national feelings, national rights and nationalism, which is different. Uh, because uh, there is uh, an attempt, uh, there is a trend among, there was a trend among Marxists to, to deal with uh, uh, well, uh, social issue and uh, uh, thinking that nationalism and national issue were uh, bourgeois or petit bourgeois uh, things. Uh, and uh, I, I think that the national issues are a part of the richness of uh, human being and of societies. So that you have also nat national rights, which doesn't uh, means that the way you solve the the, the national rights uh, is unique, and you have a full answer uh, at the level of state and social. Norms. But this is an open debate, and then on nationalism, of course, here you can be dominant and their victim. Uh, so, the, so you you have very different situation to be dealt with. The proposal is. The, uh, and the, uh, the last remark, uh, I mean the disintegration of Yugoslavia uh, and the, the way uh, it was disintegrated is, is, is a, a key issue both for understanding and also to, to resist a, a, a typical neocolonial uh, 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 project which is to suppress uh, to suppress uh, the, uh, well, which is the fact that the dominant power want to have the monopoly of interpretation and want to suppress uh, the, the reality uh, of uh, all uh, what has been the history and the assets of the others. Huh? And mm -hmm. in the European construction, there is that kind of European racism uh, identifying European Union as Europe, 
you should go in Europe, go back to Europe, which, uh, and uh, denying all assets of the past for Eastern European uh, uh, people and for the Yugoslavian world. And here you have a, a richness, which is uh, there was a revolution, you had self-management, the national issues and social issues and <coughs> political issues of Yugoslavia uh, are key questions even for any uh, uh, thinking of an alternative world. So I hope we can organize <laughs> in the future also a, a, a systematic discussion uh, to permit the appropriation of the interpretation of the disintegration, what were the causes of the failures, mm -hmm. the weaknesses, but also the assets, yeah. and, and what has been the responsibility of Western powers, you European powers, and so on, in the, the, this, and then to go back on, on all those issues which are not, uh, for the moment, uh, enough elaborated for us and which we need. Okay. Thank you all. Uh, I must finish the debate because uh, we will have now a short break and after that a lecture from uh, Professor uh, Walter Bayer from uh, Austria. Uh, uh, so, little break, please, in... Uh, five, ten minutes, uh, come back.